The title for the evening was, at least on the website, it says Evolution and God with a question mark. So I suppose I'm supposed to answer that question. So the short answer is, yeah, sure. Um, no problem if, if you want that, both, both of them together. Um, but now I'll give you a little bit longer answer. But um, of course, it's a big topic. Um, I'll start with a little bit about myself. I, I study animal behavior, uh, including human behavior. And my very first independent study as an undergrad was at Osable Environmental Institute in Michigan. And I was observing, really, it's just an outgrowth from me wanting to play with animals and see what they do to each other. So I put snakes in a terrarium together, two different species, to see how they would interact with each other. So if you put a hognose snake in with a garter snake, um, the hognose snake rears up and hisses like, like a cobra, like crazy, as if the garter snake were a mortal enemy. If you put the garter snake in with a ribbon snake, they just sort of look at each other for a little while in sort of a mutual unease. I mean, they're, they don't attack each other, but they're not exactly really keen on the situation either. Um, but if you put a cute little red-bellied snake in there with the garter, the red-bellied is totally fine with it right from the beginning. The garter snake is a little nervous at first, but then um calms down and eventually they can either slither they can even slither across each other as they're exploring and they don't uh, they don't care at all um, so that was fun as my first um, biological experiment but you know I'm 19 years old but I got to thinking about how similar that situation is to what happens when you want to create or construct an integrated worldview so um, one that combines elements that are quite a bit different from each other, like science and religion. Um, it can be like throwing two snakes into a, um, a crowded space together. Um, now, of course, the easiest thing you could do was to, would be just to pick one or the other and not try to have them work together. And a matter of fact, that's what um, Pet store owners tell you who is snakes. Yeah. I'll tell you, put them together in one cage. But um, but if you do throw them together, what happens afterwards depends on the dispositions or the personalities of the, of the different um, snakes. So let's pretend for a moment that you do want to risk this. You do want to try to have two snakes together in the terrarium of your soul. And I, and I hope you would want to take that risk. So you do want to integrate science and religion. And so you have this potentially uh, cognitively dissonant uh, experience in 2018 where you accept a modern scientific worldview, but then you embrace a personal God on top of that. Um, so how do you do this? Practically, how do you do this? So, how do you get them coexisting peacefully? And I was actually in that very situation, dealing with that question at that same time in my life when I was at that environmental institute. And by the way, um, it was run by Christians who all thoroughly accepted evolution, unlike my own church growing up or my family. So, Today, what I want to do, and I'm not going to speak for long because I want us just to be able to talk about these things a little bit more openly, but um, I want to propose two things. First is an explanatory framework. This is one way, it's a model for how you might be able to practically integrate um, these two very different things in your worldview. And then a helpful virtue for doing that at the end. That'll be the second thing I want to do, try to get these two snakes to together. Um, so the framework, or the model, is about levels of explanation. So whenever we explain anything in the universe, it, it, we always recognize that the story is not a single train of thought. It's not at a, a particular, uh, one particular level. It is uh, several stories, really, that are overlaying on top of each other, that interact in a sort of harmonious whole. Uh, the level 
levels of explanation are different from each other, but they don't conflict with each other. Um, so we can start, for instance, with, and that's why I like here at NJIT, you have different um, disciplines of science that all, that some of them don't interact with each other very directly, um, but you can find the interface between them, but nothing um, that happened in the physics department would necessarily um, uh, contradict things that are going on in the chemistry department. So you start off with um, subatomic particles and move your way through physics and into the subject matter of chemistry, reactions and things, and then move into biology. And once we're in biology, then there are four particular levels, and all of them are um, uh, the particular province of a subdiscipline of biology. Um, in such that any trait of any organism, any aspect of any living thing, that's what we're talking about in biology, can be explained in four different sorts of ways. And this is well established in biology. We teach it in our intro courses uh, generally. And so there's four different sorts of biological science that are required to explain anything about biology. And no one sort can do the work of the others or take the place of the others. So for instance, you've got, well not for instance, the four levels are physiology, which is just the mechanics, the working of body parts. And then there's ontogeny, which for regular people is called development. It's the uh, changes, all the changes in that physiology that uh, an organism goes through over its entire lifetime. And so that developmental biologists study that. And then there's function, what the things are for. Like if you study physiology or development, you don't, you're not, in, you're not investigating what anything is for, what it does, um, what its function is. And so um, that's. The answers to that are in evolutionary ecology, their adaptation, the results of natural selection across generations. That's the area where I work in biology. And then fourth is uh, phylogeny or evolutionary history. It's like your family tree uh, doesn't explain really much about you except your history. And we have a whole branch of biology, phylogenetic systematics, which is roughly a quarter of all biology. And they're just devoted to looking at the patterns we see um, in all of these things, in physiology and development and adaptation over evolutionary time. So both within lineages and between lineages. So those are four levels of explanation. They are the four ways in which biologists answer the questions of why or how um, for absolutely any trait, anything an organism is or does. Um, and the approaches are distinct from each other, but they're complementary. Every one of the four approaches has to be done. There's no, no, there's no way that one can do the work of, of another. Um, you can't discover features at any one level by studying uh, a different level. So the same phenomena are being looked at, but they're being looked at with, with different glasses, you might, different glasses on, you might, uh, you might say. So I'll just give you an example. So let's say you wanted a biological explanation, a complete biological explanation for why a particular woman is caring for her newborn baby. Um, from the perspective of physiology, we're going to be talking about neurons in the brain and the endocrine system sending messages um, electrically through the through um, uh, neurons, but then also um, chemically through the bloodstream, uh, and informing lots of changes of behavior, uh, informing lactation, uh, heightened awareness increased physical contact with the uh, with her offspring and so on. Now if we looked at ontogeny, which is development, this would analyze how all of this infrastructure developed in the woman, uh, especially during three peaks of huge change. One is when she was in the womb, and then when she hit puberty, and when she got pregnant. And that was that is what a developmental biologist would be interested in, in when you say, you know, explain why why this woman is doing this or how, how this happens. And then functionally speaking, if I were um, answering the question, um, I would be looking into adaptations such as um, well, adaptations involved with intense parental care. You've got these heightened um, emotional control centers and breasts. And you'd be investigating how these have evolved by natural selection, and uh, particularly in a social species, in a species where parental care is important. And then 
my colleagues in systematics, uh, phylogenetics, paleontologists, etc., cetera, uh, will start by noticing that parental care, or at least lactation, um, first appears in our lineage of about 140 million years ago, and then that science would uh, proceed apace. So we have four complementary perspectives here, and all of them are significantly explanatory. And when you give a complete explanation from any one of those four perspectives, there's no gap in, in your explanation. There's no place where the other ones fit in because they're not like that. They layer on top of each other. Um, they don't uh, interdigitate such that you can look for a gap in your explanation at one level. So now let's get away from biology and just say if we were to look at ourselves and our traits in an even broader context, we might um, and just leaving aside the question of whether the perspective is scientific or not, you could add an additional explanatory level, and I would call this one agency. Notice that in all of those biological perspectives that I just mentioned, nobody bothered to ask the woman why she's caring for a baby. It was like as though that were irrelevant to the explanation, right? Um, but it's not irrelevant. But the reason why we don't do that in biology is because um, behavioral biology uh, came about um, through a study of animal behavior, we can't ask the animals. But when we're talking about humans, uh, psychologists and anthropologists can uh, study agency to some extent. Biologists, with our tools, we can't do it. We don't have any tools for understanding agency, like motivations and reasons for action. Um, we, we, we don't deal with that kind of stuff. Um, so no matter how deeply we go into something, we're never going to get to a reason why somebody did something. Um, but psychologists and anthropologists, they can ask their subjects, why they do stuff, and then, um, and so you have another layer of explanation. So if we study behavior at the level of motivations and reasons, and the values that underlie those that people have, we can come up with conclusions and explanations that are just as distinctive, just as interesting as those at any other level. Just because biology can't touch it doesn't mean it's not interesting. Physics can't touch all the biological levels either. So, and then I should mention also that philosophers do it try uh, also trying to make reasonable sense of people's values that underlie their, um, their actions. So from this perspective of agency, personal agency, um, we would answer the question of why the woman was taking care of her baby in terms of why she thinks she did it, why she wanted to do it, why she decided to do it. Uh, it's a different level of explanation. So I'm sure that everybody here, regardless of your uh, religious or metaphysical approach to the world, probably agree on the separation among those levels of explanation. I have never heard anybody suggest that, um, that there's no explanation at one of those levels. Um, and very rarely, although sometimes it is the case, do, do even biologists who are very enamored with their own discipline try to rule out agency as an explanation? So even if there's a, um, a book like Consciousness Explained by Daniel Dennett that might suggest that consciousness is an illusion, Daniel Dennett has reasons for all that Daniel Dennett does, and Daniel Dennett would tell you the reasons if you asked him. And so um, that's a little bit of a, a sleight of hand to say that consciousness is an illusion. But you can see why somebody would do it because sometimes people are uncomfortable with one layer or a series of layers that's scientific not explaining all there is. And so for the hard scientists not to be able to explain reasons, not to explain motivations or conscious um, desires at the phenomenological or experiential level is troubling to some people. Now, finally, and this is why I brought this whole thing up, many of us, will want to step back even further than just your own motivations and values underlying something to the broadest possible perspective, broadest possible interpretation or explanation for important events like giving birth to children, taking care of them. Um, this, you could say, would be the highest level of all. We could approach human behavior explanatorily um, through metaphysics or religion. Metaphysics just merely meaning, in Aristotle's terms, what's next to, but not part of science, that of being next to. Um, and so here we find yet another, it's complementary and yet it's distinct, 
level of explanation um, or a level at which we can approach traits and organisms. Um, and that is of ultimate purpose. The reason why something exists, the reason why it is the way it is in the deepest and most ultimate sense. So a major aspect of, of religion, I don't know if it would be part of the definition, but I think probably anything that considers itself a religion would contain the imbuing of or the recognition of a transcendent explanation in terms of a purpose or reason for creation, uh, including humanity. And the validity of looking at things at that level doesn't depend on any biological discoveries about our behavior, and, um, nor on our actual decisions and values. It's, it's outside of that, would be the case or not the case, regardless of what we thought about it. So the Tao, for instance, is an Eastern idea of the, the way, the fabric of the universe, and of which we are a part, um, whether we like it or not, whether we know about it or not, whether we understand what that means. And from the Christian tradition, a line that I had to memorize as a kid from um, the Luther's small catechism was the purpose of human existence is to glorify God, which we can translate that into ordinary language about what we should be doing here on earth. It means to love the one who created you and everything, and then to love uh, everyone else as well um, as a reflection of that. So any behavior or any trait from any one of those types of perspectives could be analyzed, um, and it, the results of that analysis would be distinct from the results at any other level, including the reasons why you do something individually. So even if we disavow belief or any metaphysical belief, any, reject any idea of a transcendent purpose to our lives, no one would disagree that it's possible to analyze behaviors and organisms and traits at that level. In fact, if you decide to reject those, uh, that is a decision at that level of analysis. So um, it's a conclusion. We all do. We all analyze things at that level. Am I here for a reason? You know, the, perhaps the first philosophical questions ever asked by the Ionian thinkers that we have records of today are, um, who am I? Where am I going? Why am I here? And so we all operate on that perspective. The only, um, and, and so, the only question is, you know, what we're going to decide at that level. So this is the level, no matter where we end up, that addresses the deepest questions of existence, even if you decide that they have no answer or that there's but they're, or that they're meaningless questions. So going back to the mother example, a mother might, and at least a billion mothers alive now on this earth would, answer the question of why she cares for her baby, partly by saying right now, you know, she had enough time to think about it. She could say that this is part of my sacred role, my God-given purpose in the universe right at this moment. Part of it. So you might choose to engage in that, or or you might not. It's it's the level of analysis that I'm talking about more than the um, than the conclusion from from your analysis. So I certainly respect the conclusions that some of us make that. Um, we should decide in the end to reject that level, just to, to toss it out, to slough it off um, as fanciful um, or false. Um, but regardless of what we decide about that, we have to admit that, there, that we're biologically and deeply culturally um, geared, we're wired to embrace and operate on that level of analysis and asking these questions. And I personally believe, um, and there's some evidence for this, that we are happier and we flourish more as human beings when we embrace an explanation at that, at that level. Because it, um, it provides a, a deep meaning and purpose. It, it, it gives a reason for everything. Um, it provides a fundamental grounding for morality love, and it validates uh, all of our inspirations and, and, and our imagination. And it's about the fulfillment of the, the highest and most far-reaching uh, dreams of which human beings are capable. Uh, 
So there we go. There's the there's six levels of analysis, and I skipped the, 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 the physics and chemistry, of course. But um, but I mentioned that I was going to do two things to help these two snakes to get along. The first one was just showing how already, even if you don't accept any religious belief, you already accept levels of explanation um, because you accept that you have reasons. The question is whether everything has a reason. And um, you shouldn't reject that out of hand because it seems like an outlandish um, question because we already have outlandish questions that we know are true because the answers are in our own reasons and motivations. So that, that is a practical model that we can use for in, uh, integrating um, worldviews. And we have to do this already. All of us do it at some point. Now, the second thing I want to do is to sort of promote or sell um, one particular virtue that I think would help in this whole exercise um, that's actually vital for the operation of both science and religion, whatever you decide about. And, and that is humility. The, those high-strung nerves of the garter snake and the, the violent irascibility of the pognose snake, those are barriers. In thinking humans, the analogy to that would be um, conceitedness, uh, wall building, self-protection, a haughty confidence, overconfidence about your own positions and perspectives, and arrogance. And if I, as either a religious person or a scientific person, were to harbor that sort of vice, it would be just like the snakes. Uh, we, we would not be able to understand each other, much less how science and faith could integrate or relate to each other, regardless of what you think about them. So I'm going to give four brief arguments for humility um, in this region, in this area. Uh, two for the religious fans and two for the science fans. And of course, maybe we have um, people here who are fans of both, but to the religious. The, the privilege of science, the enormous, so this is to the religious um, fans out there, the enormous advantage of science is that it's self-corrective. Observations and experiments can falsify hypotheses. But religious views, on the other hand, while they're of immense importance, are not very self-correct. Um, if you were wrong about something, it's not necessarily the case. As a matter of fact, it's not very likely to be the case that anything's going to come and hit you on the head about it. You could be wrong and never even know. So the honest response to that, that difficult point that we all have to deal with is Humility, that's the honest response to that point. And another um, argument for humility to the religiously minded is a personal example. And you might not particularly be a fan of this individual person, but I think you ought to be whether you believe that the Son of God or not. 91% of the people in this country who espouse any religion at all claim to be Christians. Either the Christians are some offshoot of them. Uh, of course, we have a diversity of other religious faiths, um, I'm sure, in this room, and certainly um, in this country and in the world. But let's just use this example because the vast majority of people who claim to be members of any religion in this country claim to be following this person, Jesus. Now, what's the single most distinguishing characteristic of Jesus in everything that he said and did? It's humility. Um, it's very striking. Um, as a matter of fact, as it says in Philippians 2, um, your attitude should be like that of Jesus. Even though he was by nature God, he made himself nothing, uh, humbled himself. So that's an argument that um, should resonate with all people who claim to follow Jesus. All right, so to the scientific mind now, two more arguments for humility. One is that if you were to take a combined message of the last century of the history, philosophy, and sociology of science, this would be, if I can be so bold, the central message of those three fields, that science is a powerful tool 
in our only self-correcting way of finding out about the universe. If you have a self-correcting way of finding out about the universe, then it by that um, by virtue of that it is science. But scientists, individual scientists, are not necessarily objective. Generally, not objective. And if they if that interferes with their science too much, of course, there are plenty of other scientists who will jump on them and, and show them that because everybody has a benefit to gain by putting down somebody who has done something unscientific in the name of science. But Scientists are tempted to overinterpret their results, and even if scientists did uh, everything purely objectively, which they don't, current opinion can be overthrown in the future. And there are limits also. The, the ultimate um, uh, point to make here to take down scientists a couple notches is that there are limits to what science can and cannot say. A lot of the popular science books that we tend to read a lot of the stuff that they're saying in there has nothing to do with science. They use science as a sort of springboard to talk about things that are non scientific. So, the response to all of these lessons that we have to learn from people who have made a um, century of profession of looking at science and describing it, um, for those with intellectual integrity, what's our response to that? It's humility. You have to be humble if you're a scientist and you realize that about science. All right, then, fourthly and lastly, again to the scientists out there. In particular, this is an evolutionary argument. So for those of you who are accustomed with evolutionary explanation, you'll know that the evolutionary biologists, including myself, um, hold that the brain evolved mainly by evolution by natural selection and that our capacities for science, the very fact that we can do it and the gathering of knowledge, were primarily shaped not so that we could know things, but for survival and reproduction. So we can't claim them like the ancients could, people before evolution could, that by some cosmic accident we just happened to corner the market on knowledge, to know everything that there was, a, was out there, and or even to have a complete set of tools for making those decisions about whether we know everything and whether the limits of our knowledge are the limits of what's real, um, and for ruling out things beyond our perception. So the evolutionary argument here is we didn't evolve as knowing machines. We evolved as surviving and reproduction machines. So we should be humble about the extent of our knowledge. We have to be um, if we're going to be true to that evolutionary explanation. Now, I, I want to close by making an extension from this to living in a free society because when you're interacting with other people, that humility does double duty. So that same virtue that helps you integrate your worldview to bring these two things together and not be too overconfident about the overpowering um, exclusivity of either perspective, that same thing will also help you interact with other people who are different from um, myself or, or you in a pluralistic society. Uh, so humility opens us up to understanding, just as it opens up um, the religious mind to understand the scientific and the scientific to understand the religious, it will, under, it will open me up to, be, uh, to understand the genuine positions and perspectives of other people, um, noticing areas that we overlap and being um, interested in or at least tolerant of the areas where we don't overlap, the areas where we differ. So, I guess my final point is that we don't have to compromise on scientific standards if we accommodate religion, and we don't have to dilute or weaken religion in the name of science, or of evolution in particular, um, because they operate on these different levels that I mentioned in the first point. And also, I'm convinced that the key to integrating science and religion in general, if there was one key of science and religion getting along together, it would be the same key as for individual people getting along together, which is uh, about a personal attitude, it's about a disposition of the heart. Thank you.